Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to Game and Friday. <laughs> Had to miss the last one, guys. I'm sorry about that, but uh, we'll not be missing any more until there is no more to miss. And that's going to suck. That is going to suck, bro. Uh, definitely going to miss you here on the Game and Fridays. We're going to do Webcam Fridays, though, yep. right? Yep. And that's going to do the best that we can. Yeah, exactly. Kind of lame. But we're going to do it. Uh, just glad we've been able to do these. There's times where, as best friends, we've lived four or five blocks apart. And we'd see each other maybe a handful of times in a few yeah, years, absolutely right? Absolutely criminal, but we've made up for it for the last few years. And it's been Game and Friday nonstop. Absolutely. still going to continue in whatever way we can. That was the whole point of making Game and Fridays. Make up for lost time. Just because you're an adult doesn't mean you stop playing games or try vr <laughs> with that said let's jump right into vr news I'm gonna start with viewer daniel fritz who reminded me of something important this morning i've said in the past that look if there are genres that you typically don't like outside of vr give them another chance inside vr you may enjoy them because the difference can be massive and then he points out that I don't necessarily follow my own advice when I kind of made the jabs at social VR not really be in my bag. But have I really tried them? No. So, Daniel, yeah, absolutely bang on. Um, I need to be doing that. So when I settle in, that's going to be one of the things that I take a look at is actually giving social VR a fair shake. So thanks for that reminder. All right. Six companies aiming to cut the cord on high-end VR headsets. We've talked about some of these solutions individually. We've talked about some of these solutions as groups, but we haven't talked this comprehensively about this many VR wireless devices on a new show. That's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at a few different six to be specific solutions and kind of see where they're at. What have they promised in the past maybe? What have they actually been able to show related to that? And where the hell are they going? So let's start with IMR Immersive Robotics. Haven't talked about these guys before. For some reason I must have missed them or if I did, it was a very small kind of footnote story, but I'm pretty confident I didn't talk about these guys. Now, the difference, according to them, between IMR's wireless technology for HMDs and others is that they have been designing a VR standard specifically for virtual reality devices that doesn't differentiate. You got a Rift, you got a Vive, it doesn't care. It's going to do its best to deliver a low latency, high resolution VR gaming experience, which sounds absolutely amazing they make some other powerful claims like achieving 90 to 95 percent compression and users being hard pressed if not impossible to tell the difference running through their system or the original now haven't had a chance to try this haven't been able to find anyone who's been able to do that test it demo it so we're going to kind of um just leave it at that. Hopefully, as they get closer to launch, we can do some testing, read about some testing, and see if they're actually able to live up to those claims. But right now, as you can see, we've got a lot of different options when it comes to wireless. The next one, of course, is Quick VR. Now, Quick VR is the wireless device that Jamie Feltham from Upload VR was able to test. He tested it on January 26th. We covered it on the VR News Show. And he basically said it was underwhelming. There was notable latency, definitely issues with the PC that they were using. They blamed a lot of the experience on the PC, which was overheating. Now, to me, you would make sure, especially if you're going to a conference, that not only is your primary machine capable, working properly, you have a backup, a backup that is ghosted to be essentially identical. So you don't lose time and you're able to convey the message you want to convey, which is 
this is a low latency device. Instead, what happened, he had a lot of problems with latency and a lot of that ended up being blamed on the overheating PC. So where does that stand? I'm not sure. What I can say is as we get closer, I'm gonna to wanna to see some concrete testing from Quick VR before I even entertain the thought of purchasing them. And I gotta admit, when I walked away from that story, kind of the excitement for them stopped. And not to say it's not gonna get rekindled if it's proven to work, but let's just say I wanna see evidence of that before I entertain them any further. Next guys are NG Codec. Now these guys use a combination 2 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz rather 5 gigahertz 802.11 AC standard. That's what they're using for their wireless. For their compression, they're using MPEG H.265 slash HEVC compression, and that's a 200 to 1 compression ratio. But again, till we see this in action, it's hard to judge how well it works and what the actual latency, if any, feels like. What does that do to the experience? Nitero, we've talked about these guys. They are the ones using the Wireless Gigabit Alliance or the, the Y-Gig technology. But again, we have yet to see this in action with any kind of meaningful testing. Quark VR, their whole claim is a little different from a lot of these other companies. What they are trying to do is focus on the software side, not for compression, which you can do hardware and software, but what they're looking at doing is implementing a type of space warp for the wireless data that's traveling back and forth. They feel that that's going to be able to deliver them the experience that users are looking for. Don't need to repeat that. But same thing, we got to see that in action before we can judge that anymore. And then the last one, TPCast, probably the most obvious, but there's a reason for that. And it has nothing to do with brand affiliation, you know, the closeness that we see between them and HTC Vive. What does it for me, and I think a lot of you, is the fact that we've seen benchmarks. We've seen people actually test this device, and all of them say it's, almost entirely indistinguishable from a wired version of the same game. They all notice it. Namely, it works. So six of them, there's even more guys. There's probably close to a dozen different solutions out there that I would say are potentially serious about marketing the device and actually releasing something tangible. And so far for me, really only two or three that have me excited because they've been shown to actually work. Next news story, how one user modded his Oculus Touch to make it kind of similar to Valve's Knuckles prototypes. Now, of course, these are the ones that, the, the Valve Vive ones, you can basically open your hand and the controller is still there, available for you for when you close your grip. You're no longer having to rely on holding it, you know, anytime you're not doing an action, which I completely get that can ruin the immersion. You can just let them be, have your hands do natural hand motion type things. Then when you're ready to use the controller, grasp onto the controller, which is going to be right there in the proper spot and positioning waiting for you. Same thing applies for the Oculus Touch if they were to come up with a solution. Well, we know they haven't talked about anything. I mentioned that yesterday, hardware side, slim pickings, the focus is mostly on software and then letting the game companies talk about that software themselves rather than going through Oculus. So what does this mod do? There's two ways he goes about it. The first one is basically an elastic band with a piece of almost like gauss, you know, padding, and seems to work okay. It allows the touch controllers to stay connected to the hand, fairly well lined up, not ideally, not perfectly, so that when you grasp, you've got the controller. The second testing that they did, to me, is probably the way I'd go if I was testing this for myself, and I think I'm gonna do this. 
uh, again in a few weeks' time. And what he does is he uses what looks like just a cycling glove, like something you would use if you're mountain biking or, you know, batting practice for baseball type glove and connects it to that again via an elastic band and a strap and some sewing. So the guy behind this, his name is Frank. He, he did the mod. You can check it out. I've got the link below. It has additional links within the body of the news article. So that's of interest to you guys. Highly recommend you check that out. Next news story, Unity Beta is getting NVIDIA VRWorks for enhanced rendering features. Both AMD, AMD has of course its liquid VR technology, NVIDIA has its VRWorks. They're both based or really in existence for the cards. Polaris, for example, uh, is one for the AMD and then Pascal on the NVIDIA side of things. So some of the features that the Unity Beta is getting, first one, multi-res shading. And what that does is it basically renders each part of an image at a resolution that better matches the pixel density of the warped image. Then there's what they call lens matched shading for the Pascal devices, uses the new simultaneous multi-projection architecture of Pascal-based GPUs to provide substantial pixel shading improvements. That's one of those things we talked about two nights ago for improving the frame rate. Those are the type of optimizations that these VR friendly cards can offer you. The third is single pass stereo, pretty much as it sounds, uses again the multi-projection to draw geometry once, then simultaneously project both right eye and left eye views of that geometry. And then the last one, probably the best, because we have long complained about SLI and Crossfire on the AMD side not really benefiting virtual reality. Well, in for NVIDIA anyways, is VR SLI, which they say provides increased performance for VR apps where multiple GPUs can be assigned a specific eye to dramatically accelerate stereo rendering. So very cool, no benchmarks available as of yet to see what that translates to in terms of performance. Can't wait to see. Next story, Joe Durbin of Upload VR. He had a chance to sit down with Facebook's Michael Booth and ask some questions about their social VR objectives, specifically social apps, rooms, and of course, spaces that was just launched. Here's his responses. So first question he was asked was what the release of Spaces Beta means for Oculus Rooms, which we know was released a few months prior. His answer to that, they are separate entities, both experiments more than finished products, and they have two parallel experiences that are essentially apples to oranges. So not apples to apples, not similar enough to be able to make that comparison. One of the key differentiators, he says, is that Rooms is Samsung Gear VR, of course, and Spaces is strictly Rift. Both teams exploring different aspects of social VR. They've got their own priority list for it. He was also asked and responded with no when asked if one would supersede or replace the other. And then finally, he was asked if Spaces would ever be monetized. Now, this is the perfect opportunity usually for political speak, right? Where you basically never answer the question. His answer, however, one of the things I really, really enjoyed about Facebook and one of the things that got me to work for them is that the mandate was figure out social VR, make it fun, engaging, and we will figure out how to monetize it later. He comes from the game industry. He says, I know there's good ways and bad ways to monetize things from the good ways to monetize. There's all sorts of ways that could be done. We do not want obnoxious paywalls. And I think that's probably what everybody would hope. If you're going to monetize, exactly, not the way to go about it. What's always been okay with me, especially with the free-to-play ones, is when those offerings are cosmetic, right? 
You can make your character look a little better. If it's a home base, you can make that look better. If it's a mount or a vehicle, you can make that look better. Focusing on the cosmetics to make your character stand out as opposed to the game mechanics directly. Uh, to not feel like those people who are paying to play, especially if they're paying heavily, are getting some type of advantage. But that's just me personally. And then the last story, guys, VR Source testing the Acer Predator Triton 700 laptop. And this thing is a beauty. Now, I have a gaming laptop as well, but it's... Uh, it's good for video editing. It is definitely not up to the task for virtual reality rendering at all. Uses uh, Mobility 960 or 970. So yeah, fairly slow. This thing, however, like I said, a veritable beast. Let's take a look at the specs. 15.6 inch 1920 by 1080 display. It's not that great. Love the core though, i7 7700HQ, up to 16 gigs of DDR4, upgradable to 32, so that's good for a laptop. You can take it fairly high. NVIDIA GeForce GTX 10 series of graphic cards. So it should, according to that, be able to run the gamut of at least 1050, 60, 70, maybe not 80, hopefully it does, but that would be my guess, at least the first three. Up to 512 gigs of SSD and about two and a half kilograms. Not that bad. And like I said, powerful as hell, but the price definitely shows for it. We'll get to that in a second. The other feature it has is a pretty good cooling system. And they're calling it the new dual Aeroblade 3D fan technology, which according to them, helps in maintaining the necessary temperature for the laptop to achieve its maximum gaming performance. The testing that I've read to kind of go into this with other sources, they all state the same. It seems to do the trick. So the price tag, what is it? $2,999 US. Again, you may as well say $3,000 US. But for that, you get a hell of a lot of power in terms of gaming, especially VR. All right, guys, that is it for the Friday Gaming Night Edition of VR News. Hopefully you guys have a kick-ass weekend. Catch you later. Cheers, guys.